So you're thinking about getting your drone license. At least that's why I assume you're here. Um, I took mine back in February and of 2020 and passed with a 92%. I, you know, I was pretty happy with that. The only reason I mention it is just to maybe give some credibility. I don't know if that's good or not. Maybe most people pass with 99% or 95. Maybe 92% is the mean. I, I'm not sure. Uh, so I don't, I'm not sure if that's a brag or not. Um, but I do have my license, my card. I got it and it took me about six weeks for it to come in the mail. Now, COVID hit March, you know, mid-March. So maybe that slowed things up a little bit. But, you know, about two to three weeks after... Uh, taking the test, I was able to get my temporary certificate. You can get that from the IACRA website, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about here shortly. If you do like the video, please give me a thumbs up. If you have any creative or constructive criticism or creative criticism, please leave them in the uh, comments below and I'll try to get to them and I'll definitely read through them. So I, I And I appreciate all the support I can get with this. Hopefully you'll uh, find this useful. Uh, in this video, I want to cover what my experience was getting it. Um, I also talk about like, do you need it? Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, how I prep for the test, uh, so that you could make an educated decision. If you think you need to buy a book or take one of the classes that are available, because there definitely are a lot of organizations that are offering classes and guaranteeing like 99% chance of passing the test. And you might be wondering if that's something that you think you need to do or not. And, uh, um, so like I said, I'll give you my experience in that. And then uh, I'll give you a little rough outline of what I actually experienced on the test. So do you need your drone license? So it's pretty simple. Ask yourself one question. Are you going to make money with your drone? If the answer is yes, you need a commercial license or you need your part 107 drone remote pilot license. If the answer is no, you're just going to be like posting on YouTube, but not making any money using it for personal reasons or whatever, then no, you don't need to get your license. You can just pilot your drone uh, uh, recreationally is what they call it. Do you need to license your drone? So if the drone weighs more than uh, 0.55 pounds, 0.55 pounds or more, so it's like 250 grams um, and less than 55 pounds, then you need to register it. Uh, if it weighs more than 55 pounds, I think you're in a whole other category. Uh, they don't really, I, I didn't look into that specifically, but uh, you know, so the remote pilot's license really part 107 encompasses drones that are less than 55 pounds, not including 55 pounds, but less than 55 pounds. And um, that's pretty much it, but you don't have to register them unless they are uh, greater than 0.55 pounds or 0.55 pounds and greater, which is uh, 250 grams. Registering them costs $5 through the FAA website. Uh, and uh, so basically you, you need to do that regardless if it's commercial or not. So recreational use, you still need to uh, register the drone if it's in that weight. So that's why like the Mavic Mini is, comes in you know, at less than that, that 0.55 pounds. So you don't have to register that drone. Um, so there's positive minuses to that for sure. Uh, I have a Mavic Mini. I like it. Um, you can see another video if you want about some of the issues I've had with the Mavic Mini. But in general, I would just say like I, I like the Mavic Mini. I'm going to stick with it for quite a while. So that gets us into part two. So uh, what was it like taking the test? And I'll just explain my experience and costs and all that stuff. So uh, I chose not to take any of the classes, take any of the or read any of the books, buy any of the books or anything like that. So uh, my out-of-pocket experience for the test was $96, and $96 was just the cost of taking the test. Different testing agencies will have different costs, so you know that just happens to be I lucked out. There's one close to me. It was only $96. I think it was within 15, 20 minutes of my house, so you know a little bit of gas, um, you know, beyond the cost of the test, but. Uh, you know, there's another one that was charging $150. The company I took it through was uh, called PSI. They're registered basically at the FAA website. You have to register with uh, a website called IACRA. That's the acronym. I'll have a link down below. Um, you can set up your appointments through the FAA, through the IACRA website. Uh, they tell you where the testing facilities are. Then, you know, you just set it up. Once you take the test and you pass, then through the IACRA website, you then fill out an application and then submit it. And then luckily, because 
you're already kind of tied the, your test and your account is already tied together. You know, you, you link the two in the application and then uh, it makes it pretty easy for when you um, want to submit your application. Now the testing facility, uh, it was, it was, you walk in, it's very clinical, you know, there's just a, it's like an office building, there's a room, there's like 30 or 40 other people taking tests. And I asked the lady, I was like, what, what are you taking tests for? I mean, obviously, <laughs> I didn't, obviously, but I was pretty sure that not everybody was there taking the remote pilot license. Um, and she says, you know, they do a bunch of different stuff like uh, uh, home inspectors, real estate agents, uh, different school testing, some medical stuff, uh, tests and certifications. Um, so that's all they do is they just do test uh, facilitation. You get a packet when you take the test and that includes a like a hundred, like a hundred and something page supplement book. Uh, that's gonna have all the diagrams in it, but it's gonna also have one other nice thing. It's gonna have a, a, what they call a sectional chart legend. So the sectional charts are basically the maps that pilots use to navigate the airspace. It's gonna have a lot of details in it. So it has that included in the sectional book, uh, supplemental book, and I'll explain why that's kind of handy here shortly. But you get that supplement book, get a calculator, paper, pencil, uh, dry erase marker, um, the clear film sheet that I guess you could write on. So like if you needed to mark on the screen, you can mark on that sheet or do, do a bunch of different things. Most of the packet I didn't use. I think I used a piece of paper, a pencil, calculator once and then obviously the book. The book you use to reference all the figures. So you're taking the, the test on a computer, but it's gonna say reference like figure 42. You go in the book, you find 42, and then you know you, you reference that for the question, whatever that question might be. A lot of times it's like locating things or, or identifying things on a, you know, a map, one of the sectional maps. But it could be, there's a bunch of different diagrams in there that, that might be you know, referenced. So to take the test, you, you know, 60 questions, you have to get 70%. So you have to get 42 or more correct. I think I did my math right there. <laughs> I think it's 42 or more will give you 70%. And I think you get like an hour and a half or two hours to take the test. I think I took it in about 30, 40 minutes, maybe 40 minutes. So you show up at the testing site. They have you put all your personal belongings into a bag. They zip the bag and they lock it. Then they give you the bag, you actually go into the room. Uh, they don't have like lockers or anything like that and, you ha and they just hang it on your chair. When you're done, you grab the bag, you go back out and they unlock it for you and you get all your stuff. Now, they do wanna make sure that your phones are off because if your phone goes off in the middle of the test, like there's no, you can't get to it to turn it off. So it'll just ring. Uh, so they're pretty um, strict about that, making sure that your phone was off. Other than that, you're kind of just sat down at like almost like in a, your own cubicle kind of a thing. Uh, to, and you know, just started cracking away. Now I'll, let me go over a little bit how I prepped uh, for the test and then, well, I'll go over what's on the test, the high level, and then, uh, then I'll talk a little bit about how I, how I personally prepared for it. So as I mentioned before, um, they have something called sectional charts. So the main things that are on the test, one is gonna be sectional charts and that's reading them. Uh, on the sectional charts, it's talking about airspace, like different classes of airspace and how those are marked on the sectional chart. Uh, latitude and longitude, so figuring out where things are. They typically were asking like where an airport is. Like where's, you know, they'll show you the sectional chart and then you have to see, you know, like find airport X and give the latitude and longitude, you know. Recognizing different obstacles on the sectional chart, you know, they have antennas and Various other things, elevation was another thing that was actually kind of annoying because the sectional chart elevation is not easy to read on it. And you had to like, and, and you know, and, and the examples that I had were like, the elevation didn't change a lot. So like finding where the elevation lines were was actually kind of a pain in the butt. A restricted airspace and like military operation areas. So identifying those. Um, and then just identifying various symbols. There's so like, this flag, what does this flag mean? What is, you know, this tower with a, with like a light on top, uh, stuff like that. The nice thing is if you, if you have a brain fart or just kind of freeze up for a second, you can go to that legend I was telling you about, and you might be able to find the answer, um, to the question, 
or maybe reaffirm what you think the question or the answer is. Like, ah, oh, I think it's this, but you know, just double check yourself. Boom, yep, all right, I'm right. Okay, good. You know, and then you have that confidence going into the next question. Now on the computer, you can go forward and backwards, just FYI, before you submit everything. Uh, drone regulation. So I mentioned, you know, certain weight limit, you know, for the, the drones. So it also talks about, um, you know, what are the flying altitudes of so 400 feet AGL above ground levels, the, pretty much the standard in the United States. You know, some other regulations as far as uh, what the minimum uh, statute miles of visibility, uh, certain cloud cover. Like if there's cloud cover, you're supposed to stay below the cloud cover by a certain amount. What, um, so knowing what that is, and then regulate various other regulations with emergency situations and disasters and um, alcohol consumption, how much alcohol you're allowed to have in your system while you're flying. Pretty much, I mean, they want you to like not drink before you fly, but if you, if you do fly and you still have some residual alcohol in your system, what is the legal limit? Uh, METARS. METARS is a huge one. Um, I would say huge, but pretty big. So METAR is like a meteorological uh, report that's given out by airports, typically airports, uh, but it's in like a coded language. So you have to learn how to like figure out what, how to read that code. Uh, you know, a lot of it's just pretty alphanumeric and it doesn't seem like it makes sense if you weren't, um, if you didn't study it, but it gives the time and, and date, uh, how long it's good for, uh, visibility, what the weather conditions are, the wind, um, if the wind's gusting, if it's steady, what direction the wind's coming from, uh, if, the, if the weather's going to change, they'll have even additional information there for when it's going to change. So. Uh, reading METARs is, is pretty important. Uh, maintenance of the aircraft, basically most of it has to do with like if, it, if the drone doesn't have a maintenance schedule then you have to develop one yourself. Aircraft performance, uh, so they're talking about like stall characteristics, uh, what they call high density altitude, so that's when you get to higher elevations and the, the density of the air is less, how that changes the performance, uh, the center of gravity, and then loads on like the aircraft when you're like turning and such. A lot of it doesn't necessarily apply to like a lot of like the, the more low entry level drones, you know, where you're not going to be putting on different cameras and other packages onto the drone or you're building it yourself or something like that. A lot of like buying a, like, you know, an out of the box drone, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily going to apply to you, but it's still in case you ever do fly a drone that's more complicated and has, you know, more interchangeable parts, then this is kind of important. Uh, <clears throat> weather, so cumulonimbus, you know, which is basically thunderstorms, different stages of thunderstorms, stable air versus unstable air, inversions. You'll get quite a few questions on, on these. I mean, probably just off the top of my head, it seems like about 10 questions or so in this range of, uh, of different types of weather. Um, uh, conditions and characteristics. Personality types. So uh, they talk about machismo personality types, um, people that feel that they're invulnerable or anti-authoritarian. So they, they have like a personality type and then what they call the cure. So like, um, you know, anti-authoritarian person, you know, philosophy or, you know, kind of has the state of mind of rules don't apply to me. The cure is that rules apply to everybody. So, you know, like how to combat maybe your own internal uh, personality type that might conflict with, you know, the safety, safely operating of the, of the vehicle. And then last but not least, they talk about like a crew resource management slash, you know, um, risk management systems and safety procedures. Uh, just kind of like, I'm, I'm just going to lump all those together, but, uh, you know, basically how, how you can operate aircraft safely. Um, they may give you a scenario like so-and-so is doing this and they've had multiple accidents, what should they do to, to prevent that in the future, you know, kind of a thing. Um, yeah, so there'll be a handful of questions in, in that area as well. Now, how I studied for the test, I didn't, you know, buy a book, like I said, and I didn't take a class. And, and it's partly because I, I just geeked out on it. Like I was just like reading about it and I was just kind of fascinated by everything. So, so I was kind of like, 
pretty self-motivated to just kind of learn everything. Um, but it's not necessarily the most uh, focused approach uh, because basically what he did, the FAA uh, has some links and they have like a summary. So I'm gonna put that link down below. Uh, but the summary is gonna show basically what's in the test. But it's just a high level summary. But if you hit the topics I mentioned above, so, or just now, airspace, start with that. I just watched videos, YouTube videos. FAA has a bunch of videos on YouTube about airspace and some of these other things. But then, like, they were kind of short snippets. I, I wanted something a little bit more, uh, you know, a more comprehensive explanation. So, you know, there's a lot of people taking uh, pilot's license tests and all that stuff. So they have a lot of resources that kind of where they overlap, you know, people with pilot's license taking also, you know, and also the same requirements in the drone test. So I watched a lot of those videos, watched a lot of videos about the, uh, the weather, uh, aircraft performance. Actually, a lot of that was pretty well covered in um, some of the documents on the FAA website. And then um, once I figured out I got a good handle on it, I went and took like a practice test. There are practice uh, questions available online. There's like 130 questions that I found. So that's a little bit more than twice uh, the number of questions on the test. I figured if I do pretty well there, then I should do pretty well on the test. So the first time around, I did pretty miserably. So then I kind of identified the areas where I was weak, and then I just studied more on those. And then I took the practice test again. You know, I'm trying not to like memorize the questions, but I certainly started recognizing them. Um, and then, you know, we just kind of bone up in that area a bit more and then take the test uh, again. And then once I start, felt like I was getting nine, 90 to 100 percent right <clears throat> that I felt like I was probably ready to take the test and then I ended up doing that like I said this method is a lot less focused so you're gonna spend a lot more time probably learning about things that aren't necessarily going to be covered on the test and um, you might have to find some things that that you missed like I said it's just not as focused and as condensed so you're gonna spend a um, so it's not going to be as efficient my, my opinion is if, you, if you're gonna be self-motivated about it and you really and just kind of enjoy learning about this, you probably don't need to you know, buy a book or um, take a class. But if you're somebody who um, likes things presented in a very structured, formal manner, or you just don't have a lot of um, you know, time to waste on kind of just studying like randomly, then again, that might be getting a book, taking a class will probably be your better option. The, the downside is it's gonna cost you an extra 150, 300 bucks. I don't, I don't know what all these things cost, but, but the upside is like, you, you know, you'll probably spend a lot less time kind of fiddling around on the internet trying to figure out what, what's gonna be on the test. Again, I'm gonna have a bunch of links down below if you have any questions, constructive criticism or creative criticism. Uh, you know, leave them in, in the comment section below as well, and I'll try to get to them um, as soon as I can. Uh, before we get going, uh, if you uh, like the video, please give me a thumbs up. Try to remember to do that. Uh, it does help with the channel. If you like some of the, check out my other videos. Maybe you'll like them as well and want to subscribe. I'd appreciate it. It helps support the channel. I hope you found this video helpful. All right, thank you.